Hi everyone and welcome back to I Don't Care. This week I'm so excited to sit down and talk to my favorite author, Eileen Cook. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. I can't wait to talk all about creativity, books, writing. I am kind of a writer. I like to say I am a writer because I'm all about the law of attraction and manifesting things, um, but more of a screenwriter than book writing. But I love reading, so it all kind of ties in together. I feel like it's all one thing. It's storytelling, really, and that's what I love. So who is Eileen Cook to you? Because we can read who you are on the internet. I mean, people can read on my posts who you are, but who is Eileen to you? I think Eileen is a work in progress. <laughs> Fair, we all are, right? I think I'm still kind of sorting out who I am because I think it's changed so much. Yeah. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed, strangely enough, when you talk about that, is being a writer. Like, yeah. as long as I can remember, I have loved stories. I've loved mm. being told stories. Mm -hmm. I've loved hearing stories. Yeah. Um, growing up, I was a little bit of a liar, mm. uh, which I like to say was just early creative writing without being paid for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a great way to think of it. So yeah, my parents didn't always agree with that, but that's how that went. Um, but I've always loved it and always wanted to do it. So for me, that's the, probably the one constant in my mm -hmm. life. But other than that, a lot of that has changed, like just from... Growing up, I was super insecure and right. wasn't sure who I was. And so I was always trying to be what I thought other people wanted mm -hmm. me to be. Um, and then kind of, you know, went through a stage where I started to feel like, okay, I figured out who I am and what I'm doing. Right. Um, and I enjoyed that, but I just feel like I'm still sorting that out. So oh, I think that's the thing with life, though, is it's never, it's never going to be like a guaranteed answer of who we are. I think it's always something we're going to figure out and I'm at the beginning stages of that say, if you right? figured that out already <laughs> no. you're doing better than most people gosh I think no. most of us uh, you think there's a destination so I think yeah. so many people say like I'm gonna be happy when right I'm gonna be happy when I publish a book I'm mm -hmm. gonna be happy when my book hits a certain bestseller list yeah I'm gonna be happy when I get married or when I have a kid or right. when I when my kids grow up and get out of the house mm. or when but the problem is that bar always just keeps changing and yeah. moving. So I think the secret is being happy with where you are mm -hmm. and yet still kind of focusing on where is it that you want to go. Right. I think that's really powerful. Um, before we get into all of the nitty gritty amazingness of writing, you love dogs. I love dogs. I'm super excited because... Of course, this is a podcast that people yeah. can't see, but Luna is here. Luna is here, and you guys can for sure hear her little chain as always in every episode of mine. And she has a ball, so she's going to go at it with that. But you have dogs. I have two dogs at the moment. So I have Cairo, mm -hmm. who is he's a, he's a unique one-offer. Okay. So he's... His mother was most likely a dachshund, so he's like a okay. long dog. Mm -hmm. He was actually, he's our rescue, so he was found okay. abandoned, sadly. Uh, so we don't know his full history, mm -hmm. but um, he's probably a dachshund mixed with a Yorkie. Oh, okay. Um, mixed with maybe something else. Like yeah. he's a little bit of a hodgepodge. I love that. I love um, that. But he's my little guy, mm -hmm. um, except he's 14, so he's actually my old man uh, now. Yeah. So he sleeps a lot. And then my other dog is a West Highland Terrier. Okay. So they're called Westies. Okay. So if Aww. you ever know the um, Little Caesar dog food commercial, there's a little white dog. Oh, is that what it is? That's a Westie. Oh, my goodness. So, so Westies cute. are known for having a lot of attitude. This one here, too. Yes. She's got it. <laughs> She's got that attitude. I love it, though. It makes uh, me so entertained. If I could be as confident as my little Westie dog, mm -hmm. there would be nothing that I couldn't accomplish because right? she's just big dogs, small dogs. Like, she's out there. She's doing it. And her name is Gimlet. Gimlet. Oh, my goodness. So she's named after the cocktail. So that's I love she that. Is. Oh, my God. I could talk dogs all day because they're just so cute. And they have the best personalities. Right, Luna? Yes. And since you like movies, yeah. Cairo, my hodgepodge dog, is named after the movie The Maltese Falcon. 
Oh, okay. So it's a Humphrey Bogart film. It's an okay. old classic film noir. Okay. And there's a character in there named Joel Cairo. Okay. Who is this odd, goofy-looking little guy who mm -hmm. thinks he's a big guy and tries to beat up Bogart. Oh my goodness. And that was Cairo that... as a little guy. He oh, thought he was so the big cute. man. So that's where that name comes from. That's so sweet. Luna comes from the moon because yeah. I love the moon. And then my mom was just like, oh, I think Luna. And I was like, I love Luna. And we sat with it for a night. And then in the morning, we're all like, she's yeah. a Luna. Yeah. Because, you can tell. They tell you, I think. Well, we were basing it off of, like, one photo. Yeah. It was the night we found out we were getting her. Um, I was never allowed dogs before. And my mom was just like, uh, there's this dog that our cousin is selling. And uh, on the count of three, me and my mom and my brother were like, yes or no? One, two, three. We all said yes. And we're like, there Yay! we go. It was meant to be, Luna. It was so meant to be. It was meant be. to be. Yep. She's my, she she keeps me busy. Oh, that I believe. Yep. Oh, yeah. That I believe 100%. Yes, I do. <sighs> oh, man. I Okay. So this is a question that is not mine. It's from an interviewer that I love to watch, Meg McCarthy. Um, but it, I think it's just such a great question, so I'm going okay. to ask you. And it is, how did you discover your love for storytelling? Ooh. You know, it's interesting because I almost can't remember not loving it. Right. Yeah. Um, it goes that far back. So um, I do think part of it was my grandparents. Mm. So both my grandparents on both sides in different ways. So mm -hmm. on my dad's side, my grandmother uh, is an Irish immigrant. Mm. And she always had the gift of gab, right? Like yeah. she always had stories. So stories mm -hmm. about, she grew up like really poor and yeah. she grew up obviously a long time ago. So she talked about like having to take a brick and heat it up in the fireplace and oh, they would wow. use it to keep their feet warm at night. Wow. Uh, they'd wrap it up in a towel. Mm -hmm. So like I just remember her telling stories. Mm -hmm. And then on my mom's side, my grandfather used to sit and read to me all the time oh, yeah. and do different voices. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I remember. My parents actually saved, when I was in second grade, mm -hmm. we apparently had to do a homework assignment. I have okay. no memory of this, for okay. clarity. Like, yeah. I don't really remember this at all. Mm -hmm. But apparently we had to cut a picture out of a magazine. Okay. And then we were supposed to write sentences because we were just learning to write. Okay. So it was supposed to be things like, the dog is brown and white. Okay. The bed is white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, those kinds of things. But I was the only one in the class that strung mine all together to be a story. Nice. Oh, wow. So, so you had it in you in grade two. Apparently, as far back as grade two. So on the bottom of the homework assignment, the mm -hmm. teacher wrote, I'm sure someday you'll be an author. Oh, that's so sweet. Which, and because parents are parents and of kind course. of dorky, yeah. um, they saved it. Yeah, I love that. And so they <laughs> actually you. had it. And when I sold my first book, they had it framed up for me. Oh, that's so, so cute. That is such a nice gift. So I have my very first story, which I'm pretty sure that has to be the first one because oh I was just goodness. learning to write. What was it about? Do you know what your picture was? Yes, I actually, I should have brought it because I actually still have it. It's a guy in a suit mm -hmm. and he's at a desk. And I wrote about George the Psychiatrist. Oh, wow. So one, I'm kind of impressed with myself. How did I know the word psychiatrist? Right. I don't know. But I, I don't think I even know how to spell that now. Well, and the best is I spelled it S-I-G-H-R-E. Like, yeah, everything okay. is spelled phonetically. So okay. you have to know that phonics were big when I was in second grade. <laughs> right. Because, yeah, it, the misspellings are horrible. Yeah. Um, and it's all about George the Psychiatrist helping somebody out. Aww. Which, oddly enough, my first job when I got out of university was as a counselor. Counseling. Oh, yeah. Don't so worry. So, apparently, I had that connection right from the get-go. <laughs> oh, man. That's actually my next question, oh. is how was the transition from counseling to becoming a full-time writer? Were you writing while you were counseling? Like, how was that for you? A hundred percent. So, uh, my parents are both very, very practical people. Right. And so I always loved writing, and my dad would always say, and I'd love to tease him about this mm -hmm. now because he's in his 80s. Okay. Uh, but my dad would always say, well, you know, the English factories are laying off these days. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he would be like, it's nice that you like to write, but that's not like a job that people mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. And fair, like you don't see a lot of like author wanted in the want ads, right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, I have to like get a job of something I could actually do. Mm-hmm. 
So I kind of looked around and I thought, well, you know, I actually like people, like I find people fascinating. Yeah. Um, I like to kind of collect people, mm -hmm. like who they are and what yeah. they do and all that kind of stuff. So I actually think counseling is a really great way. Yeah. To prepare for being a writer. Okay, so you went into it as a preparation. I kind of thought it would always be useful information, and yeah. it was. And for a while, I I didn't write. Like mm -hmm. I just kind of went down the rabbit hole of being focused on work. Yeah. But I would always keep coming back to it, and I would kind of like have short stories going. I went yeah. through a stage where I wanted to write screenplays, right. so I would try that. Um, and then finally, what ended up happening is I had the realization. Um, I'm often because you do vision boards too, I can oh, tell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have always done that. And mm -hmm. I, I kept realizing like that was always on my vision board was to, yeah. to be a writer. But I was like, but I'm not doing it. Mm. Um, so earlier you said, you know, I like to see myself as a writer. Yeah. And my biggest thing to people is the first question is, do you write? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, then you're a writer. Yeah. Like that's all that it takes. Yes. Um, but I wasn't doing that. Okay. I wasn't doing that basic thing. So I kind of had this moment where I was like, is it just going to be a board that's on my wall forever? Mm -hmm. Or is that something I want to make happen? Because, and you know this, right? Vision yeah. boards don't happen just because we cut out some nice pictures and no. stick them on something. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that's not how they work. They are just a reminder of where mm -hmm. we're going. Yeah. And so I realized like, okay, that's a choice I have to make every day. Like mm -hmm. I have to make a decision every day that I want to be a writer. Yeah. And then start writing. So that's when I started to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a whole bunch. I finished a book. I sent it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted it. I wrote another book. Nobody wanted it. Yeah. I wrote another book. Nobody wanted it. It seems it. like both, <laughs> both our industries, mine being the acting one and yours writing, is a lot of rejection. Yeah. You know, you have to handle, you have to know how to handle the, the nose and the rejection, which is emotionally and mentally extremely hard but I guess with the counseling background too you kind of maybe knew how to handle your own emotions or no sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> I was like I could make it sound good yeah I mean sometimes I did I think mm -hmm. I I always understood that it's not a rejection of me yeah uh it's a rejection of something that I created which is right. not the same thing okay um it certainly feels like the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially I have friends who are in acting. And acting yeah. is even worse because it'll be like, no, oh, you're too tall. You're too short. Oh, you're too I this. Know. And it's like, that's really hard not to take that personal. Yeah. Writing is maybe a little bit easier. Yeah. I mean, I think re rejection was hard. Yeah. Um, but I finally sold a book. Yeah. Uh, I was super excited. And then what I basically ended up doing as, like, as my career was building, mm -hmm. I... I mean, the one nice thing about counseling as well is it's a job that you can slow down with, right? Mm. So I went from full time mm -hmm. to four days a week, okay. to three days a week, to two days a week, mm -hmm. to, to five, no days, to a, no week. days a week, <laughs> yeah. which was the best days of the week for yes. that. Um, and I, I honestly, I wake up grateful every single day. This yeah. is, if you had said to me at 19, yeah. you know, what does your perfect life look like? It's pretty close to where I am now. Like the idea that I get to get up and mm -hmm. make stuff up all day and yeah. uh, be enmeshed in that world is perfect. Oh, I know. I just, I know. I my my perfect world would be getting to act, direct, and write. I'm I want to do all three, and I've done all three in short films with no budgets, yeah. where I've written my own scripts and we've done it. And um, then I've directed and acted a little bit. And um, and so, yeah, like, it, it's just so rewarding to do what you love. And I can't wait to, like, do it every day and actually make money off of it. That's, yes. the, that's the big there thing. There is that it does make it a little bit even better. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. To be able to spend time with creativity yeah. is really what I love to do. And I yeah. find it exciting and I find it... Exciting to be around other creative people yes, that's huge. Um, because, you know, they get me excited for my own projects mm -hmm. and, you know, to hear what they're working on, Yeah. Um, which to me is a big part of like, if someone is in this business or wants to be in mm -hmm. this business is to surround yourself with good other creative people. I love that. 
Um, and we're going to get into, let me make sure I'm not butchering it before I say it. We're going to get into the Creative Academy for Writers later on, okay. um, which is all about surrounding yourself with those like-minded people. But I have a, this might be silly, but I, I was curious when I found out you were a counselor. You're listening to so many stories about people's lives. Were you ever like, oh my God, this person's life would make a great book and, oh, and yeah. transfer it to your own writing? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I would never take someone's full life right. because, well, one, that's not a very nice thing to do. Right. Um, and two, real life is often much more complicated than a story needs yeah. to be. Um, but I think what is fascinating for me is how you can have two different people who have maybe similar life experiences, mm -hmm. but how they see it changes everything. Yeah. So I'm a huge believer with the most important story that you tell mm -hmm. is the story that you tell yourself. Mm, that's so true. So that's if so the true. story you tell yourself is I'm a loser, this is never going to happen for me. Nobody ever makes it as a writer. No mm. one ever makes it. Like, you are creating that reality. Oh, 100%. I agree. If yeah. you tell yourself the story of, yeah, that rejection hurt, mm -hmm. but you know what? That gives me another story that I'll tell when I'm being interviewed on mm -hmm. a podcast about rejection. Right. And I learned something from it. Mm -hmm. um, I read somewhere, never say I failed, say I learned. Mm, that's powerful. And that's the thing, too, is our like our like what we think and what we say out loud does hold so much power whether we know it or not and so I watched the documentary called The Secret and there is a book yep. also on The Secret and that it changed my mind because it is all about the law of attraction and being kind to yourself and then I've had a few mentors too who I've gone to and who are like whenever you know I'm always like I have a terrible memory they're like no 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 don't say that switch it to be something positive and I'm like oh okay and there's just like lots of things that we say subconsciously oh yeah that we don't know are kind of putting us in the wrong direction and so yeah our, our thoughts are so important and so I'm much more mindful now of what I say to myself, how my thoughts are, what I say to other people, because it's just so important for us and others. So I love that you brought that up. So I, yeah, I think it's the shift of what you say yeah, and then how you carry that out in your actions. Mm -hmm. Because right? I always find it interesting. I have a few friends who have loved the secret and some yeah. people who hate the secret. Yeah. And some people are like, you know, you can't just wish yourself into a better life. And it's like, no, you can't. You're mm -hmm. right. It's not enough to have a vision board yeah. or, you know, positive. It's, yeah. it's putting that positivity into action. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you say something like, I failed, that's like there's a period at the end of that sentence, yeah. right? I failed, mm -hmm. full stop. If you say, wow, I learned this, mm -hmm. you know, then it's a, it's a much longer sentence, yes. right? Because you're talking about, okay, it didn't go well that time, but mm -hmm. this is what I learned from that experience. Yeah. And that makes you better. Yeah, you're right. You know, I was, that's, because you can't just say things to yourself. You really do have to put it into action. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are people who are so in tune with themselves who can fully visualize things happening and then they do just come to them. I am not one of those people. I visualize my life all the time, but I'm more of like, okay, now I know where I want to be. What are the steps to get there? And so... I mean, I'm doing pretty good right now with, you know, <laughs> what I can do. I uh, went to school for acting, have an agent, and I, you know, do classes and I do the podcast. So, like, I'm doing the things for me that feel like I'm going in the right direction. But, you know, at night I still have those thoughts. I'm like, oh, my God, don't forget to do this tomorrow to get you there and there and there. And so it's kind of that nonstop thing of there's always something to do, which I love personally. Keep me busy. <laughs> yeah. Can you walk me through your writing po process? How do you, when you come up with any, an idea, or how do you come up with ideas first, to then, like, the editor seeing it and about to publish? What does that Ooh, hold? It's a long process. I you know. I want to know it. Um, first off, I think ideas are everywhere. I think mm -hmm. there are story ideas in every single thing. And the most important thing that a creative person can cultivate in themselves is curiosity yeah so my favorite question is what if mm -hmm. right what if this happened what if what if I missed the bus what if mm -hmm. I missed the flight what if um, the flight went a different direction what if that mm -hmm. happened what if that like so when you start asking that question you start to notice 
stories and start to think about how they play out. So usually yeah. story ideas, there have been a few that have come to me like slam, like mm. all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, I was out someplace and I saw something and I'm like, oh, that's it, yeah. you know, but usually it's kind of a quieter thing. So mm -hmm. it'll be something where I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll start kind of like turning it over and thinking about it from different perspectives okay. or what if that or oh, what if it was, what if it wasn't that person's perspective? What if it was someone else's perspective? Mm -hmm. And started thinking it through. So yeah. uh, I'll use an example. So I wrote a book called With Malice. Yes, it's up there in my collection. Uh, <laughs> which is interesting because when I worked as a counselor, I worked with people who had brain injuries. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of my specialty area. Yeah. And so I worked with people that had all kinds of accidents and injuries. And I remember one person uh, saying to me, she said, it's just so hard because she had lost her um, short-term memory. Okay. She's like, you know, I know what happened in the time I'm missing because people have told me. Mm. But she's like, how do I know if they're telling me the truth? Oh, that's crazy to think about. And I was like, well, that would be so weird. Yeah. It's like so disconcerting. So then I started thinking like, what if, you know, you were missing time and you didn't know what happened? Yeah. And then I started playing, well, well what could be missing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what if there was something horrible that happened? What if there yeah. was an accident? Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, okay, so you don't know what happened in the accident. And yeah. then, well, what if other people said they didn't think it was an accident? What if they mm -hmm. said they thought you did something? So I just kind of almost followed the idea back to yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Oh, my God. With Malice is one of the – I mean, all of your books are the best books I've read. Oh, you're so um, nice. But with Malice was just one of those things because you don't fully trust the narrator. You love her, but you're like, hold well, on, I don't know. something's fishy. And um, but you also are re rooting for her the entire time. You're like, you know what? I don't care if you're up to no good because I, <laughs> I I'm with still you. like you. Yeah, and so it, it's so good. Plus, it's just interesting, and there's so many twists in it where I'm like. I was not expecting that. <laughs> and it's one of those things you can't put down until you know what happens at the end. And then when you do find out what happens at the end, you're like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, ah. Uh, but it's so good. All your books I can I can go on and on about. Um, okay, so that's the idea. So that's the really idea. And then I start writing. Okay. Um, and I used to be someone that did no plotting at all. Mm -hmm. Like, So I would just sort of sit down and I'd be like, I have an idea. And I'd be like... Chapter one, mm -hmm. page one. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. I have slowly become someone who really likes the process of outlining. Okay. And I actually love using screenwriting okay. um, as kind of a template. So my particular favorite mm -hmm. is a Save the Cat. It's in my it's in my collection <laughs> of books, as you can see on my wall. Yeah. So I I just first there's something about the way Blake Snyder sort of described yeah. that process that for me works really well. Yeah. Uh, and I also like, there's another screenwriter, Michael Haig. Okay, I've not heard of him. He's He's got a good one. And he's okay. got, uh, it's an interesting, it's it's all the same for people okay. who are learning screenwriting, right? Yeah. It's still act one, act two, act three. Yeah. So it's all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But he divides his into the outer journey. So what's okay. happening in the story and the inner journey, what's happening inside the character. Mm. And they you can see where they line up at mm -hmm. different story points. And okay. so I use kind of both of those. So now I definitely do an outline before I get started. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm writing. Uh, and for me, I write best usually kind of mornings are okay. probably my prime time. Not early. I'm not no. an early girl. Gosh, no. Um, no. But if I could, like in a perfect world, I like to be sitting down about 9 a.m. And okay. I'll write pretty much straight through to lunch. That's pretty early for me. I get up yeah. at 9.30. Yeah. So. <laughs> so my old day job, I had to be at work at 7. Oh, goodness. So I had to get up at 5.30. So Gosh, yeah. uh, this is a whole new world for me to be able to yes. sleep in. So, yeah, I usually write, mm -hmm. um, and then I get a draft, and I usually can write a draft pretty quickly. Okay. Um, but the hardest thing for me to learn was like, oh, but it's very much a draft. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's my big thing that I will, you know, hammer home to other people and other writers all the time is you have to get comfortable with revision. Yeah. And you have to get comfortable with the idea of like, this is a draft, mm -hmm. but there's still a long way we need to go. Oh, yeah. At least the draft, though, you can visualize the story better so you can go into it. Um, do you go to revise right away or do you give it some time? In a perfect world, I like to give it a little bit of time. Okay. I think I need like just a little bit of time out of the story yeah. and then go back in. Sometimes I'm on deadline. 
Right. And so oh, things gosh. move a little faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I'm really excited because as I was writing the book, mm-hmm. I figured something out. So mm-hmm. um, when I wrote a book called You Owe Me a Murder. Oh, yeah. It's also up there. Yeah. I was almost all the way to the end of the book before I realized I had one character that was like the gay best friend. Mm-hmm. And I was really like, oh, no, that she should be interested in him romantically. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize that till I was like at the three quarter point. Oh, wow, that's crazy. So there's a note in the rough draft where it says, from this point on, he's not gay. And then it just, <laughs> I just continued and finished the story. Oh, wow. But then I had to go all the way back to the beginning and realize, like, yeah. okay, no, he's a romantic interest. Like, that would make it much worse yeah. than if they were just friends. Oh, wow. I am trying to think, um, think of him not. I think of him not being interested because if I'm remembering correctly, I haven't read it in a while, but he was interested in her first, right? Yes. And then it took her a while because she was so distracted. She had a little bit on her mind, yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, wow, okay. So so that – and I, I do find that things change in revision quite yeah. a bit sometimes, so – uh, sometimes it stays very much the same and mm-hmm. it's just kind of cleaning up or, you know, tightening. And other times there are sometimes big story changes like, oh, this should be a romantic subplot, which yeah. means I have to go back all the way back to the beginning and make mm-hmm. sure that that makes sense for mm-hmm. the story. Yeah. Um, for the manuscript I'm working on right now, like I realized like, oh, I actually want this. It's a, they're adults. So okay. I was like, oh, I want them to actually be writers so initially Mm. I didn't have I had them in a different occupation okay so it's like okay that changes kind of everything about who they are yeah um so that was a kind of a big haul and a big different change Mm -hmm. so it depends on the book sometimes there's just kind of one pass through sometimes there's a couple pass throughs yeah Uh, and then I send it to other people to read Mm. okay and so I call those my beta readers Mm -hmm. and I have a group of people that will read for me yeah and they just give me notes, right? So, and I ask them questions like, did you like her? Mm-hmm. You know, please mark down any place where you found it kind of boring or right. where it was confusing. Yeah. Um, because one of the things you find when you have different versions of things, yeah. sometimes you cut something out and your brain remembers it, but mm-hmm. it's actually not in the story anymore. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes readers will be like, I don't know why she would do that. And you're like, well, obviously because yeah. of this. And yeah. they're like... Okay, that's not in the story anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, oh, I, I relate cut that to out. That. <laughs> yeah, because even like you'll cut something out, or something will just make sense to you, but maybe not others. And I, I sometimes like, what? How do you not understand? It's so clear. obviously this. Yeah, uh, and they're like, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once I've gotten that those notes back from other people, then I yeah. go back and I do another revision. Okay. Then I send it off to a literary agent. So mm-hmm. I work um, in publishing. Most people have a literary agent, and it's okay. their job to sell your work to the publishing house. Cool. Okay. Uh, um, and I'll put a plug in here for people who are, if you are working with a literary agent, they do not charge you money. Cool. They take a percentage of your earnings. Yeah. So anyone who says, I'll be your agent, and it's only $2,000, you want to run away mm-hmm. um, because a true literary agent does not charge you. They just that, take a percentage. That goes for acting, too. Yes. The film industry, they will take, for us, it's... um. 15%? Same with us? Yeah. 15? Okay, I think that's like some sort kind of, of law with BC or something that you mm. can't charge more, which is great for us. <laughs> don't, which I don't is want good. you to take more. I mean, and I just would always warn people, there's so many people who will take money from creative people. Oh, absolutely. So then my literary agent will take it out to a publishing house. Yeah. Uh, and the editor comes on board and the editor will have more changes. Mm-hmm. And then we revise again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then during that process, while I'm doing the revisions, they're coming up with covers and yeah. all those kinds of things. And then the book will hit the shelves. So you get final say in covers, right? What they look no, like? No, you, you do don't. not. So you don't pick your own covers? No, you do not. Oh, wow. Authors do not have cover control. Now, if you're J.K. Rowling or Stephen King, right. pretty you sure control. you get cover co- <laughs> yeah. control. We get what they call in our contracts cover consultation. Wow. So they will show you covers and they ask your opinion and they do, I mean, they want to pick a cover that you're going to like. Right. Um, but they have a whole sales and marketing team and mm. they are very much 
feel like they have their finger on kind of what works and what doesn't work. Mm. Um, they're often showing it to, there are some big book buyers. So okay. like the person who buys for Chapters Indigo, yeah. just the big store here in Canada, mm-hmm. uh, in the state or in the States, it's Barnes and Noble. Yeah. So they'll show it often to the buyers at those mm. places and ask them to weigh in. Oh, wow. Uh, so there's kind of some back and forth that will happen there. That's so interesting. I always assumed that you would just have full control because it's your story. It's your book. Are you ready for this? Yeah. You don't have control over the title. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was going to ask you, at what point does the title come to mind? Okay, so if you, oh, wow, I want to know what you would name your own books if you had control over well it's interesting because some of them they like you always have what they call a working title so when you turn the book in you have a working title okay so for example with malice has been called with malice since it was a very early draft for me okay um and when i turned it in the publisher loved that title Mm -hmm. and that was the title that we went with okay um talk to me about the hanging girl then because that switched that switched so what is interesting with the hanging girl there's a whole story there okay so i'm trying to remember what i called it uh, one line too many. Nope. I had another title even before oh, that. Wow. Uh, and when we we're turning it in, um, that book is about someone who reads tarot cards. Right. And there's a tarot card, uh, called the hanging man, which is, okay. uh, deals with uncertainty. So okay. if you get the hanging man card, mm. when you have your tarot read, okay. it talks about there's some kind of uncertainty in your life. So the All character right. has a line where she says something like, I feel like I'm the hanging girl. Mm. I have nothing in my life feels certain. And the editor's like, I love that title. And I said, I, you know, I don't mind it. I, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So we're like, okay, it's going to be The Hanging Girl. Mm-hmm. And then they came out with the cover. And the original cover, it's very dark. It's meant to look, I think, like a shack that she's kind of kept yeah. in. And I said when they showed it to me, I was like, I don't know if I like it. Mm-hmm. I think it looks like a horror novel Mm -hmm. or it looks like maybe it's about suicide right that was when Mm -hmm. I first noticed that it was called the hanging girl I was like well maybe they changed it because people didn't were offended that it was like too much about suicide Suicide. that's interesting and so I was like I worry and they were like no 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 one's going to make that mistake right well the book came out and it didn't do particularly well Mm. particularly because with malice had done quite well yeah and so about before it came out in paperback, there was this discussion, mm-hmm. and they were like, you know, we think that maybe we were wrong with both the title mm-hmm. and the cover. Do you have yeah. any thoughts? Yeah. And so I said, well, I had gone back through, and at that point, I was like, I wondered about one lie too many. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we all decided that that was a much better fit yeah. for that particular title. And it's a white book now, too. So yeah, it's, it's completely not different. Yeah. And so they totally changed it. And it sold much, much better in paperback. Oh, that's so interesting. I guess people really do judge a book by its cover then. They really do. I mean, yeah. I would say there are some people where, like, if there's a certain author that comes out and you're like, oh, yeah. I love that author, you know. I That's even, you for me. Well, yeah. I love you so much. Oh. Uh, but, you know, where you're like, it doesn't matter what the book is about, yeah. I'm buying it, yeah. right? And so you're just going to buy it. Uh, the second biggest thing that will influence it is if a friend tells you, oh, mm-hmm. my gosh, you have to read this. Mm-hmm. So this is my call out. If you have an author that you love, please tell your friends about it. Oh, yeah. I think I've um, mentioned you in, like, a few podcasts already <laughs> just because I talk books with everyone. I'm like, well, my favorite's Eileen Cook. And they're like, well, which one from her? I'm like, it's called Unraveling Isabel. That's my that favorite. Um, so, yeah, like it's always interesting to me then kind of, you know, if people mention it. And mm-hmm. then the third thing that comes up is if you've read about a book, then you'll yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing is if you're at a bookstore and I do the same thing, you kind of walk along and you're like, oh, that yeah. looks interesting. Yeah. So we definitely judge a book by its cover. When you're in the bookstore, <coughs> what area do you gravitate towards because for me it's mi- murder mystery murder horror. mystery yeah yeah probably almost 100 percent. do you like the romance um i like romance i find that i need and i have a lot of friends who write romance right i find i need like this romance would be better if there was a dead body <laughs> <laughs> yes i agree this, I that's agree. not a dead body or a mystery mm-hmm. or like i or an adventure yeah um, like I tend to like my romance with a side of something. Yes, that's why I love unraveling Isabel so yeah. much is because not only is it a love story between two people who lots of people would find that controversial, but if you read the story, 
the stepbrother and the stepsister make sense, okay? I because I've I've tried explaining unraveling Isabel to so many people. I'm like, well, it's like about like this stepdad who is actually really a bad guy, and it's like about the girl and and then she kind of ends up with the stepbrother but it's like at that point they're not step. they're like uh oh yeah. <laughs> yeah and then and I'm like I'm not explaining it but good but it's like the best book ever and it's um it's funny because I keep my good my books in really good condition but you look at my unraveling Isabel and it is the worst condition I've ever seen not because of me because it was the school library's book who somebody else checked out and lost it and I found it and I read it. It was the first time I read it. And I was like, I'm keeping it. It's like, mine forever. It's mine. Sorry to that person who That's what happens when you lose a library book. <laughs> right? And, um, and then from that point on, I've read so many of your books. I think I'm, I haven't read Remember. And I think maybe like one or two others. Um, otherwise, I've read all your books. And but I'm you like, know what's interesting with Unraveling Isabel? When that book came out, mm-hmm. I remember I came downstairs one day. Yeah. And Beep, there was an email that came in and mm-hmm. it was from a mom mm. and she was like, my daughter was reading your book mm-hmm. and loving it. So she's like, so I read it and she's like, it opened up this huge discussion about how she felt about the fact that I had gotten remarried when she was in high school mm. and that she, she wasn't in love with her stepbrother, but she resented that everyone expected her to just assume this was her new family. So the mom mm-hmm. was like, this just opened up so much discussion. This was amazing. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I feel all good for myself. I went, I got another cup of tea. I came back. There was another email mm-hmm. that came in and it was from another mom. Mm-hmm. And she was like, my daughter was reading this and I picked it up and this is disgusting. You're a horrible person for writing this. Wow. I'm having this book banned at my daughter's school library. Like, wow. And I was like, same book. Yeah. <laughs> it's the exact same it's book. The same thing. Same you book. Know, it, I loved, and I think I related to it so much because at that time in my life, I picked up the book in grade nine. Um, it, my mom was with someone, she's still with this guy, who I do not like. Yeah. But it was at the point in our lives where we were fighting so much, me, my mom, and him, all yeah. of us. He lived with us, and so I, I was like, <sighs> you know, he is the real life, you know, <laughs> dick. Ugh. And so I, I related, hate that guy. I related so hard. I mean, he's not as bad as dick is, don't get me wrong. But, I hope uh, not. No, he's not. <laughs> I really, Gosh. really hope not. <laughs> um, but I, I was like, oh, I relate so much to Isabel because, yeah, fuck stepdads, right? And so... I, I loved it. Um, but I want to I want to know now character development for you. What does that look like? Because for me, when I start writing, I I know the main character and I know that person well, and everyone else I know needs to compliment her in some sort of way. But I kind of figure out who they are as I'm writing. Um, what is that for you? It it does vary. So sometimes the story comes to me and I know the story, mm-hmm. but I don't know the people in it. Mm. Other times I have had a very clear idea of the person and yeah. then I'm the story is kind of coming in as part of it. Mm-hmm. And probably same as you, the protagonist or the main character is yeah. usually the one that I know the best from kind of page one. I yeah. usually have some pretty good ideas of who that person is. Yeah. Um, again, because I'm a counselor, I spend a lot of time thinking just from a counseling perspective. Mm-hmm. So I tend to think a lot about backstory because it's often the stuff that happens to us that sort of imprints who we are. So Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a book called Build Better Characters, um, which is all about using counseling techniques to get to know your characters better. So it actually has in it a whole counseling interview that I used to use when I was in my day job. So Mm -hmm. it would be examples of the kinds of questions I would ask a patient. Okay. Wow. Um, and what I would be trying to learn from what the patient told me, mm. um, that you can kind of sometimes ask the character. Okay. That's really cool. Cause yeah, you're right. Like what we're reading is just a point in their life, but they're already developed people. And so it's like, what is that trauma that happens? And I like, I think in all of your books or most of them, you do talk about that past thing that isn't going on right now. It's not the A plot or even the B plot. It's kind of like that C plot, what happened to them in the past. And it's just so interesting. Also with your books, 
they're so easy to read in terms of like creating that visual in your head and I don't know if everyone reads books and has visual visuals I do (laughs) yeah it's like the movie is playing um it's so funny because I was rereading Unraveling Isabel and then I went to read Pet Cemetery by Stephen King and it was so hard for me to read because I was so used to your style of the narrator is the main character and reliving life through them. And then stepping into Pet Cemetery, the narrator was just no one. He was just yeah. the narrator. And so it took me so long to figure out who everyone was, where, like, what's happening. Because I wasn't used to that from reading all your books. And so... And most books that I do read are the main character is the, the narrator. And um, and so I was like, oh, my God, am I dumb right now? <laughs> or, like, what's happening? Uh, but I... I I love to be dropped right into a a book. And I mean, to me, that's what makes reading interesting is to be in someone else's life experience because Mm -hmm. it's like, maybe I have never done that or been there. Or sometimes like, you know, you're talking about your stepdad. Like sometimes it's like, oh yes, someone else has had this experience. And so you feel kind of like seen or heard or whatever. So it is definitely a kind of think kind of a personal style, like mm-hmm. how you want it to come across. Yeah. Um, they're all my books are movies to me. Yes. Um, they've all played out in my head and I can see all of that. And for mm-hmm. me then if I'm doing my job right, yeah, then that's playing. And it may not look exactly the same. So my vision of Isabel may not be your vision of Isabel. Right. Um, and I'm totally fine with that, but mm-hmm. I do want it to be a similar experience. Okay. Let me tell you, and we're going to play a game later and it's like a spoiler, but, um, my Isabel is me, like literally visualized me. Yeah. And so everyone else is someone that I don't yeah. know, but Isabel was me. I was like, yes, she looks like me. She is me. She talks like me. And so I made Isabel me, which I love. It was so fun. So, um, at what point, I guess we kind of talked about this, but when, before you became someone who prepares your books, um, at what point did the story kind of unfold and make sense for you? Well, and I think it's something that always unfolds. So now Mm -hmm. I definitely plot out before I get started writing, Yeah. but I never see it as permanent mm. um so I'm laughing because on your wall you have all your post-it notes yeah and I have the exact same thing on my wall so mm-hmm. I have post-it notes and I and I like post-it notes because it's not permanent yeah oh, it can yeah. be moved around I can change my mind with stuff mm-hmm. the story sometimes the characters are like no not mm-hmm. that it's gonna yeah. be something else mm-hmm. and you have to be kind of okay to go with that yeah so I think being comfortable with nothing being permanent Mm -hmm. is a really smart way to be because sometimes I mean I've gotten all the way done with the draft and I've revised the draft and Mm -hmm. I've had someone like an early reader be like it'd be cool if this happened and then be like of course like of course that has to happen why did I not know that has Mm -hmm. to happen Mm -hmm. Um, and then being open to changing it yeah um, I'd say the biggest mistake I made as an early writer was Mm -hmm. jumping in too fast right and I was in a hurry I was in a hurry to write the book. I was mm-hmm. in a hurry to finish the book. Mm-hmm. I was in a hurry to try and sell a book. Um, and I, the best thing I've learned to do is slow down a little bit yeah. and give the story a little bit of time to kind of percolate. Yes. <laughs> that um, reminds me because the first um, screenplay that I wrote was just for me. And it was like a couple pages long, super short. And then I had some people read it and they're like, that's actually good. Like make it longer, make it something that we can make and we will all film it and and create it with you. And I'm like, okay. And so I went back, we had a bunch of drafts because it wouldn't just be me. Like I was the one who, you know, put things together, but then I would send it out to all my friends and be like, okay, what do you think? And, um, one of my friends, because in acting college, we're all kind of different ages. Um, one of them had, uh, gone to school prior for writing and had a major in writing. And so I'm like, okay, you, I need you. Um, cause he's creative as well. It's not just, he knows how to write. And so he helped me just make, it's a, it's a psychological horror. And so we really went into the, the psychic. We're like, okay, 
this can happen and we can make it gruesome here, but why? Like, what are his what intentions and what are things that the audience wouldn't pick up until the end? And so it was just so fun writing. I think it was more fun to write it than to film it. But um, I just love it. And the characters, they come when they come. Some of them that you just know who they are. Some of them you struggle with. Um, but yeah, it was just so fun. And so I don't know where I was and, going And with stories that. will change. Like, I think the biggest thing is some stories have come to my head almost like they just drop in and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, this is what that story is. Yeah. And it will almost not change at all. Mm-hmm. And then I've had other stories that have changed a lot over the yeah. process of writing. And I think I used to believe that I just had to figure out how to write a book. Like, once mm. I knew how to do it, that would be fine. Okay. And the truth of the matter is, every book has been a little bit different. Mm-hmm. So, some write really fast, some write really slow. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it depends what's happening in your life yeah. on top of things. Right. So, that can make a difference. Um, but just being like, there is no right way to do this. There's mm-hmm. just whatever way is getting me to the finish line. Yeah, whatever works. Whatever, whatever works whatever is what works works it's meant to you. be. What is the hardest part of writing? And does it differ when you're writing thriller versus like romance and like the genres? Uh, I think the ooh, that's there's a few different things. So mm-hmm. I would say with thriller the hardest thing nowadays is to create a twist that people don't see coming oh I can see that Um, just because I think so many people read and love thrillers now that they're often three or four steps ahead of the writer yeah Um, so you have to either come up with a twist they didn't see coming but still feels fair and just Mm -hmm. because you can't be like oh it turns out that Luna's a dog demon and that's you know poor people are like wait what yeah so it has to be legit it has to be earned it has to feel fair yeah um in romance it has to be an honest emotion you Mm. can't just say like you don't fall in love with someone because he has great hair like right it might be what attracts you initially. Mm-hmm. It might be, you know, like, well, hello. But yeah. that is not, like, real emotion is more than that. So so drilling down to what things really are. Mm-hmm. But from a writing perspective, the hardest thing for me is always about the three-quarter point. Okay. So I get that far, and then all of a sudden I think, like, I don't know how to get this all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's holding up. It's not that good. Why did I think this was a good story? This is always the point where I come up with a brilliant idea for something else. You know, right. it would be a much better book. It would be this other completely different thing. <laughs> yeah. And I should write that instead. Uh, I yeah. shouldn't finish this one because this is horrible. Mm. Um, so I still have that moment yeah. every single time. The only difference is now I know I have that moment. And right. I'm like, oh, I bet I'm about the three-card play. <laughs> Which book of yours was that three-quarter point the worst for you where you're like oh this book really I can't publish this I know I don't have all of them there I know and used to be used to be there's two books yeah there's two inside that I can't remember what the second one is it might have been the almost truth oh my god which is which is the best twist ever by the way um and I I think because I I didn't know that was going to be the twist okay um so not to give it away to people but there is something that's I think unexpected it was unexpected for me so oh how God, about it that was so <laughs> unexpected um so I was playing with something different and then I was like oh that's what it should be and then kind of honestly once I knew that mm-hmm. then it did fall into place okay but I was trying to force another ending okay and it was like it just didn't feel very satisfying mm-hmm. and I was like well can you I know. ask what that ending was uh the ending was just more where she, of course, she thinks something has happened. Yeah, yeah. And she realizes that she's wrong okay. in the in the version, right? Okay. And so she's completely wrong. And it's about her coming to terms with her wanting to be someone else. Oh, and it's okay. not that. So it, it's a much softer ending. And okay. it didn't fit like it fit with the rest of the book. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't figure out how to make the ending work if what she believed was true yes because then I was like well how is that gonna like without making the people in her life these horrible people yeah um because it relies on her parents if what she thinks is true you think like her parents would have to be these horrible horrible people I have to say the relationship with her dad was one that by the end, I did love. And, you know, throughout it, you're kind of, like, with her, like, oh, my God, like, I'm sorry that 
you have to, you know, live with parents yeah. who don't really like you. And- yeah. And and so by the end, I was like, oh, my God, wait, that's crazy. But it makes sense. Suddenly, once I knew what the twist was, which I didn't know when I started mm-hmm. it, it was like, oh, that's why they're the way they are. Mm-hmm. That's the way she's the way that she is. Yes. And all of a sudden, it all made sense. I have to say that the almost truth um, was the book that shocked me the most ah. I read it in one day and let me tell you <laughs> I get migraines I had a migraine while yeah. reading it but I did not care I was like I have to know no. what the heck happened I could not I'm like okay one more chapter okay one more chapter you I have to, to eat Alexia like come yeah, on. just one chapter it's not that no finish the damn book it was that good oh man I I love it okay we're gonna get into game number one all right and it's I called it actor on character Okay. Which is, um, we're going to talk about a couple of your books. If it was turned into a movie, what actors would you want to play the characters? And I'll I want to talk so about, I want to talk about Unraveling Isabel first. And I also have answers too. So you can, you ah, can say you yours. have answers? Yeah. Oh my God. I'm, a, I'm all about playing the games. You're on point. Because yeah. she's like, I've got a sheet of paper. I'm ready to go. I got pictures of the c- actors so you could visualize my interpretation. But I want to know yours first. So for Isabel, who or anyone? Well, now I'm gonna put you in Isabel. Right. Yeah. Now I, I'm casting I am the you. Only Isabel. Which would make sense to me because in my mind, she always she does look similar to you. Like I always wanted mm-hmm. an actress who was kind of slight, dark haired. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, if it ever does become a movie, I am I'm going to give you a little ringle ding off. That's <laughs> yes. what's going to happen there. Uh, oh, it's all, I'm horrible at this. I'm trying to think who I would cast. Who um, did you have? Okay, so I had me for Isabel. Yes, we have to go with you. And then for um, Nathaniel, this guy named Felix, he has an accent already. Oh, so, I like the looks of Felix. Right? In the book, I, I believe that... Dick and Nathaniel, they have an accent, yeah. right? Um, and then sh- her name, what's her name? Mar- the mom? What's it? Yeah, her name is um, um, uh, Abigail? No, that's the different one. Yeah. Her name, I just called her mom. I just called her, I think of her as mom. I so think her name is mom. mom. Uh, Marissal N- Nick- Nichols? Surely I'm saying her name wrong. And then he's Charles Estine. So she's in Riverdale. Yeah. He's in a show called Outer Banks. And he's in a show called Ginny and Georgia. I, I would go with this cast 100%. Because they're who I see. And 100%. I'm thinking these two got to be together, right? Yes. So they, they got to. I would support that. Yeah. He's uh, got the hair. Who does? He does. Yeah. Nathaniel. Sorry, Nathaniel. I'm pointing. Felix that doesn't work. Lard. Doesn't I work. I know, they can't hear us. <laughs> like, but I'm pointing so well. I know. Okay, so what about for You Owe Me a Murder? Ooh. Where's my You Owe Me a Murder? This is fun. Yeah. I, I don't know if you're going to agree with my casting on this one, but um, go ahead. If you can think of any actors that you think. I'm terrible with names. This is why. I'm no, awful. No, me too. That's why I'm like, pictures. Pictures are yeah. good. Yeah. So, and you owe me a murder. She has to be a little rougher. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. she's not as polished. She doesn't have it together. She's not, like, necessarily classically pretty. Okay. Oh, maybe mine's not right because I have a crush on this girl. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, she's not, like, but, like... If anyone's watching the new Game of Thrones, House of Dragon or whatever, okay. the actress, she plays Rihanna. She's the princess. Mm-hmm. It's that kind of look, like where it's a little bit unusual. So I okay. think you would notice her that way. Okay. What about for Nikki? Oh, Nikki. Now, I have to say, reading the entire book, I had this one actress in my head, and I've only ever seen her in one show as a small character. But she stuck with me, and she has a British accent, and I'm like, this is Nikki for me. And I think you'll agree when you see her, maybe. Let's see. I could see you as a Nikki. Yeah? I can yeah. kind of do a British accent. Yeah, you'd have to pull the British accent off. Yeah. But if you could do that, I could see that. So Nikki is definitely... Oh, she's polished, uh-huh. right? 
So she has it, like, it looks like she has it together. Mm -hmm. But she has to be able to have that look in her eye where Mm -hmm. you're like, I don't know if I trust you. Yes. All right, now I got to see who you picked. Okay, so for... For um, Kim, is it Kim? Yeah. yeah. I picked, her name is Madison Bailey. Okay. Um, You know, in this picture, she's got a bun. Yeah. So, but she, I think, in my opinion, she's too pretty for what She might be describing. too pretty. Um, Nikki, this. Nice. The, her eyes stick with you, which I think yeah, is perfect. They're blue. I know it's like awful quality, these pictures. Oh, that's fine. But she has that like, her yeah. eyes stick out. In my mind, Nikki's eyes would stick out. Yes. Um, for the mom person yeah. that um, Nikki is talking about, yeah. I picked Emmy Rossum. She's the main character from Shameless. Nice. Um, she's just so beautiful. I had to like add her in something. She had to be in. Yeah, well, let's cast her. I like that. That works. Finn Wolfhard, Stranger Things. Yes. As Alex. Perfect. And then Connor is, his name is Joel Courtney from The Kissing Booth. Yeah, definitely. I've. I don't know. I think if I was going to go, Alex is perfect. Yeah. So Alex is bang on. Yeah, the like like, nerdy kind of look. Nerdy, but kind of still sexy and that kind of like, "Mm, hello. Yeah. Connor, he might need to be even more frat boyish. Yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking that later, like, ooh, you know, blonde, blue eye, maybe typical. Yeah, that real, like he does have the perfect jawline. Like. Yeah. Like, because he should be that kind of guy where you're like, you look like you should work at Amber Crombie and Fitch. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yes. you know that you should work there. Yeah. I think he, he's he got one of those looks where, like, you you know what happened to him. Yeah. Where you'd be like, oh, that sucks. But if he was so hot, you'd be like, oh. <gasps> yeah. So, yeah, I agree. Connor could be a better pick. Um, Then with Malice. Again, I don't know if you're going to agree with my with Malice pick. I'm interested now. But... Here's what we got. So Let's see it. For Jill, Sabrina Carpenter. I don't okay. know if you know who yep. she is. And then for the mom, Christina Ricci. Or Richie. Lovely. Say, and they look good together. And then dad, Jake Gyllenhaal. Now this is a high okay. budget movie. Yeah, fair. <laughs> and then for Abigail, we have, what's her name here? Quintessa. Um, she's from a show called Trinkets. Then the mom of Quintessa, or I mean nice. of Abigail, is... Aubin Wise, and then the dad of Abigail would be Ricky White. Very nice. And he's from The 100, and she's from a show called First Kill. The, I like them. Actually, they work. Yeah. I would want somewhere to put Ryan Reynolds in. Not um, because he fits, really, but because I have a crush on Ryan Reynolds, yeah. and if he's in the movie, then I can meet him. You know, we can take Jake 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 has to go. Jake has to go. I'm afraid it's going to have to be Ryan. But I think what I like to do when I watch shows, my favorite thing is seeing the parents. I want them to look like the kids. Yes. They have to pull that together. And so I try my hardest with that. But, you know, these Jake does have, like, I mean, Ryan may be look too nice. Like, that's the problem. Ryan Reynolds looks nice because he probably is nice. In my mind, he's very nice. Mm -hmm. I hope he is. Yeah. Um, And I'm sure Jake Gyllenhaal, for Claire, in case he's listening to this, I'm sure Jake Gyllenhaal is a lovely person. But he can pull off, like, Jill's dad is a little bit colder, a little bit more business, yeah. a little bit. So so Jake may be able to pull that off a little bit better. Well, too, I was just watching um, a movie with Jake in it, and um, he was, like, just torn up. You know, he had a daughter who he can't really see. He, his job in it was he was a 911 caller. And so most of the movie took place in the, like, office building. But I don't yeah. know. Just the way he played it was so raw. And I, after I watched that, I was like, oh, he would be a good dad. For, we'll give it to him. We'll give it Jill. to him. We're just going to have to find someplace else to put Ryan. Yeah. We can, okay. well, we can place Ryan in one of your, oh, is it used to be where she's talking yeah. to her dad? Maybe, you know. We can the do phone that. calls can be like a split screen. And That'll Ryan work for me. And can, can be there. Um, I know and used to be, we start off not loving the dad, but we get there when we, you know, learn more yeah. about him. Well, that was that game. I've been waiting to ask you this question All because right. at the end of every book where we learn about you, it, the description is always, you wished you were somewhere else or someone else. Who did you wish you were and where did you wish you were? Uh, I grew up in a small town in Michigan, mm-hmm. uh, and in fact, 
if you read The Hanging Girl. Okay, yeah. Um, that is basically the town I grew up in. Okay. Now, it's grown a lot since then. It's a lot bigger and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But when I, I mean, my graduating class from high school was 100 people. Wow. And Mine was 500, I think. Yeah. We were 100, and 10 of them were foreign exchange students. <laughs> wow. And everybody else, like, we had gone to school for together the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like, so it was a very small town. It was the kind of town, like, if you were doing something, somebody else's mom would come out and be like, is that you, Eileen? I'm going to call your mom. Oh, Do you know yeah. what I mean? And so I just, I wanted so badly to have a big life. Mm. And I was like... I, and to be clear, in case anyone from Traverse City is listening to this, like Traverse City was a great place to grow up and it was super safe. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I had great friends and I had all kinds of good things, but it just felt like a place where you always knew what was coming around the corner. Right. It was a place where everyone I went to high school with was white. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everyone I went to high school with was Christian yeah. or Catholic. Mm-hmm. Like there was variety was not exactly the spice of life where no, I grew no, up. No, yeah. And so I desperately wanted to be someone who traveled to, to interesting places, mm-hmm. who met interesting people. Mm-hmm. I wanted to meet people I didn't know, like, oh, that's Brian. He threw up in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, where we all remembered. Yeah. Remember when he threw up at the desk? Ah. Like, I just wanted to have that kind of life. So that was what was missing Mm -hmm. for me. Okay. Oh, I love that. Because, yeah, I'm always like, you know, where does she wish she were? Like, what is it? Because, you know, we can all, I relate to, like, wishing I was somewhere else because I would love to be in L.A. I'm like... The weather is nice right now, but you know what Vancouver winters are like. Have you ever driven in L.A.? No, Uh. but I've been. I I know, I know. Yeah, I I think for me it was, I just wasn't happy with myself. Like, and I spent so much time worrying what other people thought about me. Mm -hmm. And here's the newsflash. Nobody was paying that much attention at all. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's interesting because I now talk to people I went to high school with and they were like, oh, you're always nice and funny. And I just always, I had this terrible image of myself yeah. and I just, I doubted everything and um, I wasted so much time yeah. being worried about what other people thought instead of just being who I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, There's this quote that I love and again, I think I've said it every episode just because I love it so much. Um, and it's a tattoo that will be on my body soon. Um, and it is, I will not tiptoe through my life to arrive safely at my death. Because, and what you were just saying, like, you know, not doing things because you're afraid of what other people might think or what the result might be is tiptoeing through your life just to one day be dead. I always so, worried, like, is somebody mad? Do they like... I worried so much yeah. about people liking me. Yeah. And I think now, like, I didn't even like them. Like, why did I care? <laughs> why did like, I care? Why was that so important to me? Yeah. To have everybody's approval. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the one thing writing taught me is it doesn't matter what you write. There's going to be someone who doesn't like it. Oh, yeah. Like, that's the nature of the business. There'll be someone who hates the book and will be like, that's a horrible book. Mm-hmm. And part of what I learned by having to get used to that was like, oh, like people could not like me and you know what? I'll be okay. Yeah. I'll yeah. turn around. Yeah. Um, I have a tattoo on my ankle mm-hmm. uh, and it's a compass. Okay. And that comes from, in part, my mom used to say to me all the time, mm-hmm. you have to be your own North Star. Aww. Um, Which I love because yeah. it was that thing of... Don't try and set your direction by what other people want or who yeah. they want you to be. You have to set your own direction. And then underneath it, I have in Latin the words ad maioria, okay, uh, which mean? means onto greater things. Mm. Um, and I think it is that idea of too often we set our expectations low. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's because we're afraid, like, well, what if I try and I don't get it? Yeah. Um, and some of the best writing advice I ever got is from a writer named Ivan Coyote. Okay. And Ivan, um, pulled me aside after class one day Mm -hmm. and they were like, you know, you're a really good writer. You should be sending your stuff out. Mm, Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, I want to, but like, you know, I tried to send some stuff out and I Mm -hmm. got rejected and all this stuff. And Ivan looked at me and they were like you know, no one's ever just going to show up at your house and ask if you have a book to be published. Oh, yeah. Right. And I was like, yeah. 
And Ivan's like, here's the thing. The worst thing that's going to happen is that you won't make it as a writer. Yeah. But here's a news flash, Eileen. You're already not made it as a writer. Yeah. So the worst thing, you're going to be right where you are now. And yeah. I was like, oh. Like, yeah. that's the worst thing that's going to happen is that I won't reach what I'm wanting to do. Mm-hmm. But it's certainly 100% not going to reach it if I don't actually do something. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we all have things that we tell ourselves in that quote that I said. That's one of them. Yeah. But another thing is... Okay, if you try, you at least have a 50-50 chance of success. If you don't try, you have a 100% chance of failing. Okay. So try, like, you know, and even with reaching out to people and being like, hey, you want to be on my podcast? It is either a yes or a no. And the no will get me already where I'm at. Yeah, so whatever. they're already not on the podcast. Yeah, and a yes would be great. And so that's what I'm doing, even with people who, you know, might 100% say no. I'll still try because there's a there's a chance that maybe they say yes. You never know. You never know. Um, did you... So you talked about earlier knowing that you wanted to be a writer always. Was it always in the form of being an author or was it maybe with journalism or... I never thought about journalism. Mm-hmm. I think I always knew I wanted to make stuff up. Okay, yeah. Um, I was open, I think, to doing something that might be more like advertising writing or copywriting Mm, because it struck me like, well, that's a real job. Ah, But it wasn't that I really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I always knew, I I think I always knew I wanted to write. I always think I knew I wanted to be probably books, although Mm -hmm. I I love movies. Yeah. Um, And so I definitely thought about like, oh, I might like to, you know, write a movie someday. And I would still say I'm intrigued. I've you know, had the chance because I've had some things that have been optioned for film. Mm-hmm. So nothing has yet been made into a film. Okay. Um, I think all your books should be because I think so too. They're amazing. Uh, and I, I can't give details, but I can say Netflix is looking at a couple things and I would like them to very much do it. Oh, look at you, you know, an actor. I well. know. I'm just saying <laughs> Netflix, we can make this happen. Yes. Come on. Let's do it. Netflix. Let's do it. Netflix. Yes. Um, Manifesting it. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, so to me, there'd be, I'd love to be involved in any way that I could, just because I think it's such an interesting art form. Oh, yeah, it really is. Also, I was thinking, too, my favorite show is called The Hundred, um, which was based off of a novel. It wasn't, the novel wasn't out yet when the show came out, but anyways, um, and like, there are lots of books. I know um, R.L. Spine, oh God, what is it? Is that right? The Goosebump series? Yeah, so he's had a lot of his stuff become books and, or I mean, movies and shows. But I'm trying to think of interviews that I've I've watched of these authors, and they're like, yeah, we don't really get much say. Once it's, you know, in the director's hands and the producer's hands, we just have to uh, sit back and let it all happen. Would, are you someone who's like, yeah, that's fine? Or are you like, oh. I think you have to accept, if you do anything with film, Yeah, I think you have to accept that unlike a book, a book is my project. So yeah. I get to decide what the book looks like. Now, I don't mm-hmm. necessarily get, you know, the cover or the yeah. title, but whatever is within the those pages is 100% yeah. me. Mm-hmm. If you're doing anything with film or TV, this is a collaborative process. Yeah. So the costumer has an idea. The set designer has an idea. The mm-hmm. director has an idea. Each actor is coming to the project yeah. with an idea. Mm-hmm. Um. And that is what makes it such a unique, energetic thing. Yeah. So for me, the best advice I got from someone else who actually had one of their books adapted mm-hmm. is she said, you just have to know it's not your book anymore. It's a yeah. new, different art project. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can enjoy that process, yeah. then that's great. And again, I've had a few things where they've worked on screenplays and so forth where the screenwriters have reached out to me and been like, you know, I'm curious your thoughts on this or why did you want this character to do that? Yeah. And anytime I can be a part of it, that's great. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I've seen the finished script and been like, what? Yeah. Um, but then I just remember myself like, it's not my, it's not my book. It's a yeah. new and it's a different project. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so far I've been okay. Good. Oh goodness. We'll see. Yes. Okay. I love knowing this because though we're in different industries it's kind of like that the first time things happen for you you get excited so what was the first time like when your book got published like what take me through that day well, I have or two, that time two funny stories mm-hmm. that are related to this so the first book I ever had published was a book called unpredictable okay um and 
I found an agent and the agent agreed to take it out. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I'm big on visualization, right? So I had all these constant daydreams about how it would be when I got, and writers call it the call. Yes. When you get the call where the agent calls and says, we have an offer on the book. Mm. So I was like, how it's going to be when I get the call. Yes. You know, and I pictured myself because I was at work most of the time. So I'm Mm. like, I'll probably be at work. And I'll be like, throw my office door open and yell to everybody like, my back is being popped. You know, and so it was all these things. And then I wasn't getting the call. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't getting the call. Mm -hmm. And it was out and we were being rejected at a couple different publishing houses. Yeah. And so, like, initially, every time my phone rang, I would, like, lunge. You know what I mean? Like, I could, like, I had supersonic hearing. I could hear it ringing, like, four doors down or whatever. And it wasn't ringing and it wasn't doing and all this stuff. And so one day I was home. I had the flu. Mm-hmm. I felt horrible. My car had broken down the day before and I yeah. walked home in the rain because it wasn't working. And so I was home and I thought it was going to be the car repair place calling. Mm-hmm. And so I picked up oh, wow. and it was my agent. And she said, are you sitting down? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, we sold the book. Wow. And I was, it didn't feel like I was like, she was like, you were the calmest person I've ever called. Cause I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and she's like, well, do you want to know about the deal? And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. I want to know yeah. the deal. Right. So she told me the deal and then she was like, okay. And I was like, okay. And I hung up and I was, I was home alone. Yeah. Right. And I was like, huh. So like I called my then husband, we're divorced yeah. now, but I called my then husband and the his secretary picked up and he's like, oh, he's in a meeting. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. And I sat there and then I called my parents yeah. and they weren't home. Okay. So I'm like, okay. And then I called one other person who wasn't home. And yeah. I was like, okay, nobody knows. And then I ended up calling back and saying, can you get him out of that meeting? It's yeah. kind of important. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he got out of the meeting. And then it started to feel a little, but I still felt like, Almost at any minute, I was going to be like, I told all these people, and then it was going to be like, you know, you made that up because you're high on NyQuil, right? Yeah. Like, and I was like, oh, right. Yeah. That didn't really happen. Yeah. Um, but several months later, the book hadn't even come out yet, mm-hmm. uh, and I was going into a meeting, mm-hmm. and it was my agent on the phone, so I picked up my cell phone, Yeah. and I said, oh, Rachel, I can't talk to you right now. I've got to go to a meeting. And she said, okay, I just wanted to let you know that... Um, we've had a film option on it mm. and I'll call you with the details when I'm done. And like, she hung up and I was like, um, <laughs> like now I have to go to a meeting, meeting? Uh, like what? about like, you know, some boring thing. Like yeah. I was sitting in the meeting and I was like running. Uh, right. And I've, I ended up being like, I'm sorry, everybody, excuse me for a minute. Yeah. And I went back out and I called her and she said, Oh, now we have three studios competing. We've gone to an auction. Wow. She's like best money on the table tomorrow morning is who wins. And I was just like, it was only like 11 a.m. I'm like, how am I going to stay at work all day? Because yeah. people would be like, blah, 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 the photocopier. And I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. There's three film studios going <laughs> right now. Yes. Um, so it was just, that was more of how I envisioned it. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so exciting. Because I'm, I'm in that stage of uh, creating things in my head. Oh what's that callback going to be like? What's the first time I'm going to find out that I, I've booked something like? And in my head, I'm like, uh, in my head, if I'm home alone, I'm, I'm super excited. But if other people are home, I'm calm. And I don't tell anyone because I'm one of those people yeah. who I don't tell anyone. And so it's, uh, it's I don't know, who knows what the heck's going to happen. But I'm always like, fingers crossed, it's going to be soon. Uh, what makes writing worth it for you? I think it's being heard. Mm. I feel like I have a, and you're like, yes, you do have a lot to say. We've been talking forever. (laughs) I I have a lot to say and I have a lot of things that mean a lot to me and are important to me. And, um, writing is that chance to kind of figure it all out myself. Yep. Um, so I always think everybody who writes the first version is always for you, right? Yeah. Um, every single character I've ever written is partly me, mm. you know, and I was at a conference. It was only like, <gasps> it was Excuse me. just before the pandemic. Yeah. And I was on a panel and one person raised their hand and she said, uh, in every book you've written, the main character is trying to figure out who she really is. Oh, is that yeah. something you're working on yourself? And mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, every character <laughs> I've ever written is somebody figuring out who they yeah. are. And I was like, Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think too, 
they're gonna be people figuring out who they are because they're teenagers as well, right? And it's in a time of their lives where shit's going down. So I think they have to change and learn who they are. Well, that's why I liked writing YA. Like some people have said, and the book I'm working on right now is an adult book, but people say, why do you write YA? You're not a teenager and you don't, I don't have teenagers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was like, I find it fascinating because it's this weird time in your life where you're not a kid, but you're not necessarily an independent adult. Mm -hmm. You have strong feelings about things, uh, but yet other people can still like, especially when you're still in high school, your parents can be like, we decided we're moving to Saskatchewan. Yeah. And you can be like, I don't want to go to Saskatchewan. There's nothing there. And it's like, <laughs> sorry, people of Saskatchewan, I'm sure it's lovely. I haven't yeah. been to your province. Um, but, uh, you know, like, you don't have a choice. Like, mm-hmm. if your parents are like, that's what we're doing, we're moving. Yeah. You're moving. Yeah. Um, I remember in high school, I had one friend and her parents found religion, like, really seriously. Mm-hmm. And they threw out her clothing and because they wanted her to wear, like, long cover skirts, everything. cover everything yeah. up, be much more modest than mm. she particularly wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And it was like, she went to the police because she was like, I have a job. I paid for those clothes. Yeah. And the police were like, it's your parents. They can make that call. Mm-hmm. And I just remember in high school being like, that's not fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. They have control over everything. everything. Yeah. And I so know. that to me was interesting. And and you're trying to figure out, like, who do you want to be separate from your parents? Yeah. And it's that kind of exciting but also freaky thing. Like, yeah. you could, like, once you hit 19, you can be like, you know what? I'm moving out and I'm mm-hmm. moving to L.A. Yeah. And nope, nobody can stop you. No. Nope. I um, mean, uh, in an Italian household, things might be a little different. but um, They may tr- They legally they try. couldn't stop yes, you. they legally couldn't. That's for sure. Um, Although I'm not legal in America. So I don't know yeah. how that would play out. So, yeah, it's just that very strange thing to yeah. me. It's a very interesting time in your life. It is also, too, because we are trying to figure out, like, who we are. And during that time, your parents don't like that change either. Mm-hmm. You do anything different than you usually do, and it like, oh, you're a whole new person. I don't like who you're hanging out with, da-da-da-da-da. And it's like, whoa, I'm like just trying to figure me out. <laughs> like, relax. <laughs> like, let me figure it out, and then we'll talk about it. It's, yeah, it's a... Uh, Change is hard, and change is hard for parents. Oh, yeah. My parents do love. I kept diaries. I always journaled. So I kept diaries all the way through junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm a fully grown-ass woman, I have gone back and done interpretive readings for my parents Mm -hmm. for my journals. Oh, my gosh. Which they find hysterical because it's like, my dad is an asshole. (laughs) Three exclamation points. You know, and then I will detail, you mm-hmm. know, this, like, and neither my dad and I will remember yeah. whatever the particular thing was, something yeah. that he didn't let me do. My dad was very strict. Yeah. And I, you know, didn't like that growing up. And so it's, we have a lot of fun with it now, but it was a little bumpy for a yes. while. I know. I had my mom and my brother on my podcast too a couple of weeks ago, and we're talking about things, you know, that even just happened in high school. And for me, that was not yeah. too long ago. And I'm like, you were so mad at me for no reason. It yeah. was, and they're like, they're like, I don't even remember yeah. that. I know. It's so fun when you can talk honestly and open and you're you're like, I'm not going to get in trouble right now. It's a different, yeah. It's yeah. a very different thing. There's Absolutely. some things I still, my dad's like, whatever. I'm like, it's best you don't know. Yeah. yeah. You know, let's yeah. just. Some things still don't. You don't still don't want to know. Yeah. I want to do some rapid fire questions All with right. you. I love rapid fire. So, what is the biggest mistake you could make as a writer? Giving up. Oh, very true. Or not starting, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, which one of your books do you want to be made into a movie? Oh, not fair. <laughs> um, with Malice is one I'd love to see made into a movie. I think that would be such a good one. Um, what's the most emotionally difficult book you've written? I would say it's the one I just finished. Oh, okay. And uh, you can't know yet. You can't know. Yes, you'll come to know it. Yeah. But it, but it was because of stuff. I got divorced in that time mm. period, and the pandemic happened. Oh yeah. And those were both two big whammies in my life. Yeah. No kidding. Gosh. Uh, the first book you've written. That was published, or the first book I've wrote. Not published. Oh, I can't remember what I called it. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's a retelling of the Jack the Ripper story. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, uh, oh, what, what book would you like to reread? What book would you like to read for the first time again? Of anyone's? Yeah. 
Um, A Prayer for Owen Meany by um, John Irving. Oh, I've not heard of that one. Um, Can conflict in storytelling be taken too far? Almost never. No? Okay. I like that. Um, Your favorite place to write? On my sofa. Ooh, with like your computer on your yep, lap? got my laptop, got my dogs. That's your my tea. favorite place. Got a cup of tea. Oh, I love it. What is your favorite book that you read in 2022? I just read a thriller, which I loved, called Wrong Place, Wrong Time. Oh, okay. And it's interesting because uh, the main character is a mom. Mm-hmm. And in the opening chapter, she's waiting for her teenage son to come home. Mm-hmm. And she's looking out the window and she sees him attack and kill someone oh wow and so she's obviously horrified the police yeah. come her son is arrested mm-hmm. she's like why would you murder someone he yeah. won't tell her what happened chapter two opens it's the day before the murder oh okay so she begins to go backwards through time yeah and she's trying to figure out what led what her happened? son kind to of commit like murder. with malice kind of like with malice except she's actually time traveling oh she's like like the chapter two, she wakes up and it literally is the day before the murder. Wow. And she's like trying to stop him. Like she finds a knife in his bag. And so she's taking the knife out. Yeah. And then the, it, basically she realizes that she's going back in time to try and stop her son from being someone who would commit the murder. Oh my God. That is so interesting. It's really, it's really fun. So yeah. wrong place, wrong time. Oh there my go. gosh. This year I've just been reading fiction books and I'm so good so good um I think the one I so I've ordered a book and it won't come until the end of the month I think it's called bones and all it's going to be made into a movie or a tv show like it's already in production yeah with Timothy Chalamet okay so like a big thing um and I was like okay Let's read the book because I'm a I like to read and then watch which I wasn't always like but now I am and so that's, and I think it's uh, horror as well. I mean, it is yeah. horror. So I'm excited for that. That'll be good. I know. I can't wait. Um, let's talk about the Creative Academy now for sure. writers. So what is the Academy um, and why is it, how is it designed to help writers? So the Creative Academy came about because initially there were three of us, mm-hmm. myself, uh, a woman named uh, Crystal Hunt, mm-hmm. uh, and a woman named Donna Barker. Okay. Uh, now we've expanded. We have Stephanie Marie Candiago. Oh, wow. Fancy. <laughs> I just like saying her name, Stephanie Marie Candiago. Yes. Um, and it came about because we're all writers, mm-hmm. and we wanted to create a place where writers could come and hang out. Yeah. Um, and where we would be supportive of each other. Mm-hmm. So. One of the things that I'm very big on is creativity is not a competition. We're yeah. not track stars. Mm-hmm. Um, there is always room on the shelf. So acting, I think, is harder because there is a competitive yeah. element of it, right? Yeah. Um, writing for for book purposes, it's not competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, but too often people make it competitive. Okay. Who can have the better story, story, that kind of thing. You know, and yeah. you're always worried, like, did they get an agent? I don't have an agent. Right. And, Mm -hmm. Why did they get this publicity? And I didn't get that publicity. Um, And we're just big believers that we all do better when we support and lift each other up. I think a big thing, too, lots of us creative people were not the people who did sports growing up either. So competition is like... This is not not our thing. thing. No, not at all. Um, So we wanted to create a place that we could have writers come and hang out. Yeah. And so it's an online community. Yeah. Um, we have what we call a pay as you can model. Mm-hmm. So it, if you can't afford it, it's free. Yeah. Uh, if you can, you know, chip in something, then we ask that people chip in. Yeah. Um, we have weekly classes and different things. Mm-hmm. So Stephanie uh, teaches uh, tech and tools. So she okay. does a lot of things like if you want to design your own websites mm-hmm. and various things. Okay. Um, Donna's is an accountability group. So she hosts mm. a weekly accountability group where people can come and check yeah. in on what they're working on. That's important. Yes, it yeah. is. Got to keep on target. Yes. Uh, Crystal does a couple of different things. She also does craft, which is where my focus is. Okay. But she also does a lot of things on indie publishing. So some oh, people okay. are doing indie publishing. So she's great on that. Mm-hmm. And she's also um, a psychologist by training. So oh, that's nice. how we know each other. Yes. Uh, and so she does a lot of things around like getting in your own way yeah, and how to focus. And then my particular focus is mostly on the writing. Okay. Um, so I hold a weekly group on mm-hmm. everything from like we talk about dialogue mm-hmm. or conflict or any of those kinds of mm-hmm. things. And they're all recorded. So the sessions, 
you can listen to them later. We yeah. bring in guest speakers. We have oh, good time. nice. Do you have um, every week it's the same day and time? Yep. What day and time? I, I My craft workshops are yes. always Wednesday mornings okay. at 9 a.m. Okay. Uh, and then they're recorded, and they go up usually three days after that. Nice. Uh, so then and then people they stay can, forever? And then they stay pretty much forever. So you can do a search. We've been going now, I think it's, we're coming up on three or four years. Wow. Yeah. So there is a ton of content mm-hmm. that is in there. I do go back through, and some of the early ones I take down just because it's like I have new or better thoughts on yeah. that, so I want to yeah. change it up. Um, but we have some stuff. My agent has come on there, so I did a Q&A mm-hmm. with my agent, so a lot of people are curious yeah. Uh, about that and we brought other literary agents that have come mm-hmm. in and talked and we've brought in some bestsellers yeah. that have talked about their experience wow um and one thing that i love is we have people in the creative academy who are multi-published who've done a lot of things amazing and we have people who are writing their very first book mm-hmm. so that's what i like why is it important for writers to have a community of other writers or creators to go to I think it's two parts. One is there are so many people in this world who will be happy to tell you why you can't do something. Yeah. Um, it's a lot easier to tear somebody else's dream down than it is to have your own. Yeah. So I think you need to be surrounded by creative people because they're also dreamers. Mm-hmm. Um, and their dreams kind of like when I talk to other people about their projects, it gets me excited. It gets mm-hmm. me excited for my own project. Yeah. It reminds you that other people have been there. So it doesn't feel any better to be rejected. Yeah. But when you sit down and someone is like, oh, yeah, let me tell you about my rejection that I got mm-hmm. last week. It's like, oh, okay, like this isn't just me. Yeah. This is happening to other people. So you can kind of pick yourself up with mm-hmm. that. And lastly, you learn a ton from other people, right? Like yeah. someone is like, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And it's like, I didn't think to do that. That's interesting. I want to try that. Yeah. Um, and it pushes you to be better. I agree. I think you definitely have to surround yourself around, well, it's always you never want to be the smartest person in the room, too. No. And so um, you have, when you're in that type of space, you're not, because you're going to learn from so many people, and they will keep you accountable. And so it's just, it's a great um, type of environment for writers to want to be in and should be in, especially if it's free as well, and you can pay whenever you want. Is there a membership, though, that uh, no membership at all? Uh, You become a member. Like, you join. We call call you a member. Yeah. Uh, But there is no fee to to belong. Okay. Um, So some people, a lot of people kick in, like, a certain monthly amount. They're like, you know what? I could, you know, this is worth a couple Starbucks to me. Yeah. You know? And they just pay on a monthly. Some people are like, you know, they'll they'll kick in when they can. Some people are just at a stage where they they can't. Okay. So it's not like there's tiers? Like There's no tiers. Okay, cool. That's really... And no one... No. Nobody offers stuff like that, really. And it was really important to us. We had a big conversation about it because initially we were going to have tiered membership. We were going to yeah. have like, this stuff is free for everyone yeah. and then this is tiered membership. Mm-hmm. And we just had the realization like being creative shouldn't come at a cost. True. Um, and too often it does. And for mm-hmm. a lot of people, it, it's hard. And then during the pandemic, yeah. it was hard for a lot of people to be laid off and they yeah. didn't have any cash. And you know what's interesting is when we decided to switch it, and we switched it early on in the pandemic is when we changed from a paid yeah. membership model to a pay-what-you-can model, our income almost doubled. Wow. Which I found really interesting. Yeah. So one, we just had a lot more people who joined, mm-hmm. and then they found it valuable, so they were willing to, to kick in. Wow. And so we ended up doing better financially. And to me, that was that reminder, I think too often, it's yeah. like, if you put good things out into the world, good things come back. Oh, yeah. That's so important. I uh, I love that. I wanted to bring that up because that's something that you're working on. And it's not just, you know, it's a it's something that people can, can get something from. So I really wanted to talk about that. I want to play another game with you. Have you ever okay. heard of MASH? No. Okay. So I'm going to try to explain it well. All right. So here's a little sticky note. You can... Go ahead and write on there. I all right. grab you a pen and a pen. So, okay, first of all, who's your favorite character that you've written? Oh, that's always so hard. <laughs> Why know. do people do that to me? I know. Or, or just one. Just one character that we can focus this game Tim on. on. Yeah. Um, let's do Kim from You Owe Me a Murder. Okay, sure. So, um, oh, that's cool. 
I'm going to like this. Okay, so <laughs> we picked a character. Okay. Now we, okay, gosh, I should have reread the instructions uh-huh. before. Okay, so now the first one says marry, right? Or life partner. Yeah. So you're going to pick three people, can be celebrities, people from the book, doesn't matter, who you think Kim would have a relationship with, or maybe that she would hate to be in a relationship with, or both. Mm, okay. And you got to tell us who it is. Okay. So that's part number one. Um, and then we're going to kind of do the same thing. So like, okay. whatever, what's the next thing that's there? House or something? Depends which way I go. Uh, kids. How many? So just a ra- couple random numbers of kids okay. that you think she might have or would hate to have. I, f- I feel like him would have no kids, in my opinion. Strangely <laughs> enough, that's one of the ones I picked. Was, oh, yeah. I either think she would do like one or none. Yeah. Is the what I think most likely. Yeah. And then I went with like six, like where she would just right. do something completely random and have like her own Brady Bunch thing happen. Yeah. And then the next job. thing is jobs. So three potential jobs or something she'd hate. Okay. I mean, I have to say Hitman would be one of those, right? <laughs> <laughs> she did kind of get herself into that situation. Yeah. And then what's the last one? Is that house then or? Car. Oh, car. Three cars. I keep oh. saying house, but. MASH stands for mansion, apartment, shed, or house. house. That's that's where it comes from? Yeah. So now it's I wrote count how many. Oh, so, so four. We have the number four. And um, each, you have to like count. So M would be one. So it would be like one, two, three, four. You would okay. then circle H for she would then get a house. And you would keep doing that until okay. every, until... Each category has a circle. Okay. All right. Tell me what Kim's life would look like. This was fun. Okay. (laughs) So she's going to end up with Alex, which is nice. I think she's happy about that decision. Yeah. That's going to be good. She's going to end up as a writer. Oh, interesting. Because she's someone who's making notes and paying attention to what's going on. So she's intrigued. So she's going to end up writing about this at some point. Mm -hmm. She's going to have no kids. Okay. Which I thought was the most likely, yeah. actually. So that one kind of came up. And she's going to drive a fancy Aston Martin car. You know what? She's living a good it's life. It's not too bad, actually. I feel like it's life. come up uh, pretty good for her. She's got her dream man. They live in a house. They got a fancy car. She's got a wonderful job and no kids. And no kids. She's got all the time in the world. I think that's the best life you could live. I think she got pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I think she's pretty, she did pretty good. lucky. Look at that. Look Way at to Kim. go, girl. Yeah. She wins. Yeah, Kim wins. She gets it for the win. Oh, man. Um, What was your family's response then to finding out that you were transitioning your career? You know, what's funny is because my parents were always, like, super practical. Yeah. And now they are, like, the most geeked out ever. Mm. So when I sold my first book, my dad was still working at the time. Yeah. And he worked at a manufacturing place where they did car parts. He's the accountant there. Mm -hmm. And he bought a copy of my book for everybody who worked at the factory. So you have to imagine all these factory guys. It was a romance. It's a Mm -hmm. book called Unpredictable. It was a romance story. And my dad bought a copy for everybody who worked there. And I went there and signed them. Oh, man. Oh, I want you to sign one of my books. That just unlocked a memory. I'm like, oh, my God. A hundred percent. I will sign sign that book. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting to me that, and now he's still like, my dad is my, I always laugh. He's my number one fan Yeah, because like any place he goes, like someone could be like, wow, it's a really nice sunny day. My dad would be like, yeah, sure is. My daughter likes to write about sunny days. She's an author, you know, like he would find any, it doesn't Um, matter what you're talking about. My dad will find a way to drop into casual conversation. That's so That I'm a writer. So he loves it, which I always bring up to him. What happened to the English factory thing, dad? Mm -hmm. Because he was, both he and my mom are very practical. My dad's an accountant. My mom was a nurse. Yeah. Um, so they're very like practical. Oh, accountants are the most accountants yep. or yep. the most yep. realistic you gotta people ever. You got to save money and you got to yeah. be responsible and yeah. you got to do all these things mm-hmm. and um, went to Catholic school for 12 years. So, yeah. you know, you toe the line kind mm-hmm. of thing. And so now he's just all about it. So he loves it, which That's is great. That's so sweet. Um, are you? Do you read YA ever, or are you like, I'm just a writer for that? Uh, both. No, I love reading YA, mm-hmm. and it was interesting because when I first wrote YA, yeah. 
Um, my very first book that came out was an adult kind of romantic comedy. So yeah. kind of like a chick lit kind of rom-com. Mm-hmm. And I wrote that book and sold that book. And it was right as rom-coms were just falling off the cliff and mm-hmm. no longer going to be popular. Mm-hmm. So I wrote the first one and then the publisher was like, yeah, we're not going to do any more rom-coms. Yeah. And I was like, I've waited forever to be a writer. You can't not publish me again. Yeah. <laughs> and my agent at the time said, I think you have a great voice for YA. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I don't think so. Like, I don't have any kids. Like, I don't really think of my, you know. And she was like, well, I don't know. I think you'd be good at it. Mm -hmm. So I went to the library, which is my free plug. I love libraries. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I went up to the library and I said, can you just make me a stack of, like, what you think are the best YA books that are out right now that people like? Yeah. And I took home about 15, 20 books. Mm -hmm. And I read through them. And I went back and I was like, give me more. And I read through those. How long does 15, 20 books take you to read? It depends. It depends on how long the book is okay. and how, like, because I can read a book in a day pretty yeah. easy, especially. If, if you're really interested. If I'm really interested yeah. in, like, some books, like, you know how, like, some books are less, like, you get on and it's, like, zing. Mm-hmm. And then other books, you're, like, I gotta think about that for a little bit. Yeah. That's um, me with Daring Greatly. Gotta yeah, sit you gotta, with like, a small bit. choose, right? Like, yeah. that's, like, you read a little bit and then you gotta think about that one for yeah. a little bit and then you gotta yeah. read a little bit. Um, but I can read a book in a day. Mm-hmm. Like that's a doable thing. And I plowed through a lot of those, y- a lot of YA books. Like yeah. if you're writing for teens, you better keep the pace moving. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, they've got too many other distractions mm-hmm. to find you interesting if you're not keeping it interesting. The phones, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. One, you, even watching TV, if you get bored for one second, we go to our phones, phones to check what's up. Yeah. Yeah. You it's... know, you got to check TikTok. You're going to scroll through like... So you better keep it really interesting. So I read a bunch and I was like, I love YA. Uh-huh. Um, and so ever since then, I've still continued to read it. And yeah. I mean, that was one thing that YA did for me is it also introduced me because because I don't have kids. Like I was yeah. like, I, you know, it's kind of creepy to hang out with teenagers, isn't it? <laughs> like yeah. who wants to be that person? But I, you know, I started doing high school visits and mm-hmm. I started reading a lot of teens and it's like. I don't know if teens are cooler than when I was a teenager or like if it's distance looking at other people, but I am so inspired by so many of my readers because yeah. I think my generation has kind of made a mess of the world, to be honest. Like mm-hmm. it's kind of screwed up and yeah. it's not looking so great. <laughs> um, sorry about that. <laughs> but like when I talk to teenagers, like they, yeah. they're going to change the world. I agree. Yeah. Um, and they see the world in a different way, and they are so much more open. Mm-hmm. Um, I really feel like when I was growing up, like when I was growing up, for example, there was no like gay straight alliance. Yeah, there was not like, and if you were gay, like that was like weird. Yeah, you know, and we certainly didn't talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and here's the newsflash, which shocks nobody. Mm-hmm. It's not like there were people who weren't gay. Oh, yeah. Like it's not like we didn't know about. Like mm-hmm. it was, but nobody talked about it. No yeah. one ever did anything with that. And now there's just this openness and people are like, teens now are like, this is who I am. Yep. Yeah. And you can like it or not like it, but this is who I am. And yeah. I just think it's amazing. I know. I know. I love it too. That's This podcast is all about those conversations that back then people wouldn't have. And so that's what I focus a lot of a lot of my time talking about because it is so important. And sometimes I do have people being like, you know, you shouldn't talk about stuff like that or the way you said it, because I'm blunt, I'm a blunt person, and they'll be like, I didn't like the way you said it. I'm like, well, I said the truth. So if that upset you, I'm sorry, but maybe that's a reflecting moment. And, yeah. and this or is maybe com- it's a reflecting for me too, yeah. right? Because sometimes I might say something and you might be like, that hurt my feelings, yeah. right? Because I feel like I'm still learning. And, you know, like, again, when I grew up, we didn't talk about people who were gay. Yeah. Like, it just wasn't a thing, you know? And I now I have a friend, her son... Um, see, I just screwed it up. Mm-hmm. Her daughter yes. is trans, mm-hmm. right? And it's been a learning thing for yeah. me to learn pronouns and to, yeah. to learn those shifts. And so I may say something where I'm offensive. And I I am glad now that people, particularly young people, mm-hmm. are comfortable with like, hey, actually, mm-hmm. that's not the term that we yeah. use. That's not the language that we use yeah. anymore. Um, and I think if you can open yourself up to being like, oh, the way I see the world may not be the right way. Mm-hmm you're going to learn so much more stuff. Um, I am that person who's like, we don't say that. We actually don't do that anymore. And I tell you, it annoys people so much. Because 
I'll repeat it. Every time they say something, they're not supposed to. I'm like, we don't say that anymore. That's not what we say anymore. And they'll be like, oh, my God, okay. And I'm like, well, you're not learning. (laughs) Well, and I think for a lot of people, and I know I catch myself on that, is if someone corrects you, you have this desire to explain, like, why you're not a bad person. Like, well, I'm not racist. Yeah. I'm not transphobic. Mm -hmm. I just screwed this up. And, like, I feel like I got in trouble. Right. Right? And it's this realization, again, of switching from not... I failed or I got in trouble, but I have a chance to learn something. Yeah. That's not the pronouns that that person uses. Yeah. Well, and and the thing too is, you know, 20 years ago, some words that aren't okay today were fine. Sure. And so it's just learning to adjust your vocabulary. And so some people genuinely didn't know that some things we don't say. And so, you know, I'll... I'll, that reminder of like we don't say that anymore is not you're a bad person. It's just a hey, we don't do that anymore. And sometimes you learn why. Like one of the ones yeah. that happened just recently for me is I had said to somebody like, "Oh, writers, those people, those people are my tribe, mm. right?" Mm-hmm. And I've I've used that saying like, and I I mean it in the sense of like this yeah. is my group Community, of people, yeah. right? And one of the people that I know was like, you know, we're not really using that anymore because of of people who are First Nations yeah. and the stuff like that. And I was like. I never thought of it that way. Like, I never thought of that. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Okay. Like, and am I going to use it sometimes? Probably. Like, Mm because it takes a while to make that shift. Uh, For my friend, it's a shift for me because I knew her daughter Mm -hmm. when her daughter was her son. Yes. And, like, I've known her for 15 years, right? So it's been for a very long time, right? And so it's that shift for me. And that shift. But people... Don't mind if you're learning. Not at all. It's People if mind don't. if you won't learn. Yeah, that's the big thing. And making like mistakes and knowing, oh, I'm so sorry, I meant to say she. Like that is a great thing because you're conscious of the mistake you made and willing to change immediately or willing to change at all. And it's a, those people who's like, no, but you're a he. And it's like that's what we don't like. And so change. And learning is huge, and that's literally what all life is. Yeah. So, and I think having those just like I love that you're having those discussions mm-hmm. because I think when I was growing up, there was a lot of people we don't talk about that. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you just don't talk about it. Like yeah. I tease my dad because when my dad and my parents gave me the quote unquote the sex talk, yeah, I re- I can I'll give it to you all so you can have it because it was a very short conversation. Okay, cool. My dad and my mom sat me down. Uh, I was in high school at the time, mm-hmm. uh, and my parents sent me down. They're like, well, you know, you're at an age where you're starting to date and see boys, yeah. uh, and you might be thinking you want to have sex. And of course, first off, I was mortified because my parents actually said the word sex. Yeah. So I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. So I was like looking at my, my parents were like, my dad was like, here's the thing. Your mom and I think sex is an adult decision. Mm-hmm. We don't think you're an adult. Okay. So if you think you're an adult and that you're an adult and you can make that decision, that's fine. But then you don't live in this house. We don't pay for your university. Mm. You don't do all that stuff because you're an adult. Wow, yeah. And I was like, okay. Crystal clear. <laughs> Good guys. talk. Yeah. Good talk. It's yeah. so funny. My mom did not have the talk yeah. with nor me or my brother. She gave yeah. us each a book. And his was blue. Mine was pink. Yeah. And it was super thin. And it's what a period is, what sex is, what the body parts are, yeah. Wear condoms, da 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 yeah. da, and that's what me and my brother learned from. Is yeah, the no, book. mine was very much like if you're having sex, you're probably a whore. Yeah, like yeah. that's what you needed to know. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. you know, I'll just take it from there, I guess. Mm-hmm. So it was just something we just didn't talk. So I just yeah. think when you can have those conversations, you may not like what someone is saying, yeah, and you don't have to agree with it, but listen, but just listen, and mm-hmm. you can make it. I mean, I make decisions all the time about who I want to have in my life and what yeah. people I want to have in my life, and. You know, that's fine. I agree 100%. Before we wrap up, I want to know, what's your biggest, like, pet peeve with books? Because let me tell you mine. And I respect Daring greatly, but let me yeah. tell you, it does it. And same thing with the book Sapiens. The longest chapters ever. <laughs> you Every page you're like, okay, this chapter's got to be done, right? And it's like a quarter of the book is one chapter. And I'm like... Oh, it feels so rewarding when you get to a next chapter. And with some books, you're like, it's never getting to another chapter. I need this to end. (laughs) Yeah. That's my biggest pet peeve. What about yours? My biggest pet peeve is when 
um, a character does something or mm-hmm. the story takes a turn mm-hmm. that wasn't earned. Mm-hmm. Like I love when you're reading along and you're like, I'll pick like a sixth sense because if I'm spoiling that, you're really behind the times. Yeah. That movie's ancient, right? But the first time you saw Sixth Sense where mm-hmm. you're like, wait, he's a ghost? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, everything now makes sense. And you go back to the beginning mm-hmm. and you watch and you're like, it was there the whole mm-hmm. time, yeah. right? I love that. What I can't stand is when someone gets in and they're like, and he's a ghost. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. Or it, not, it was all a or dream. dream. Like, no, no it's not. You can't do that. Like, yeah. that to me is a cheat. That's yeah. what I, like, when I teach writing, I tell people, you can't cheat the reader. It mm-hmm. has to, if you're making that person the killer, then if they reread the book, they should be able to see it. Yeah. The entire time. The entire time. Yeah. If you're suddenly pulling it out, like, here's a character you never saw before. Surprise! Mm-hmm. They're the ca- Like, mm-mm. That makes me angry. When it makes the read more enjoyable, too, because you're connecting some dots, and you don't really connect it fully yet until you get told it, but then you're like, oh, when I totally kind of knew that, but not at all, well, but I think I did. Yeah. Well, I love sometimes, sometimes you do guess, like, yeah. and I don't mind if I guess ahead of time, as long as it feels like if I feel really clever, like yeah. if I'm like, oh, oh, I know what she's doing yeah. here, and I can kind of see it coming, and I love to see, like, am I right or mm-hmm. not right kind of thing. Yeah. But when it feels like, yeah, oh, surprise, it's this thing that was never there, yeah. I'm like, that's cheating. Yeah. A waste of me reading That's this right. book. That's right. Don't make me do that. That will yeah. make me very angry. Oh, yeah. Um, can you let everyone know where they can find you, your social medias, where they can find your books, and all sure. of that good So I, I have a website, which is nice and easy. It's mm-hmm. EileenCook.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that has all my social media links if you want to find me. I spend probably the most amount of time on Twitter. Okay. Because I'm old. <laughs> uh, and it's Eileen Cook Writer. Okay. And I also love Instagram, which mm-hmm. is the same, Eileen Cook Writer. So that's where you can definitely find me. Uh, if anyone's interested in writing, then yeah. please join the Creative Academy. It's yeah, absolutely. the Creative Academy for Writers.com. Okay. And uh, I think you can also find it on my on website. Yeah. yeah. I tried to make that easy. So yes. you can find me there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're really committed and you want to take a lot of classes, I also teach for Simon Fraser University. Oh, wow. Uh, so I teach and they have a program called the Writer's Studio. Okay. So I do teach for that program as well. Is that a full-time program then? It's, no, it's it's designed that you can be doing it while you're working or doing okay. something else. It is 10 months long. Okay. So you're stuck with me for a long time. Yeah. And the goal is really that you're writing a novel in that 10 months. Oh, So nice. that's typically what we're doing. And is 10 months usually how long it takes to write a novel? Uh, 10 months is usually what it'll take you to get a draft. Okay. Okay. So you might, I mean, some people get to, can write a book in a really short amount of time and mm-hmm. they can polish it. Yeah. Most people, it takes them about six months to 10 months to write a draft. Mm-hmm. And then depending on how many revisions you have. How, so you've been working on the book that you're working on now since before COVID? So, yes. This is the book that has taken me the longest to write, mm-hmm. and it was because I definitely got derailed. So yeah. I got divorced, which I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just I ended up having, of course, to sell my home and buy a new place okay. and kind of start my life over yeah um surprise yeah um and so in doing all of that and then the pandemic hit and then we weren't going out anywhere so I first wrote a book during the pandemic that was a very thinly veiled book about my divorce okay um except the main character killed the cheating ex-husband yes of course (laughs) you know so I wrote that all book I sent it in and my agent's like do you really want this book out there and I was like no Mm -hmm. I don't Mm -hmm. um so I put it to the side and started writing this one. And so this book has taken me about a year and a half. Okay. I have to recommend you an album by Kelly Clarkson because it's all about divorce as well. Ooh. And I've not been divorced. I've not been married yeah, don't, in 19. Yes, don't, don't do it. No, it's genuinely, <laughs> I, it's not my plan. Don't no do marriage, no kids for me. Um, but it's called Meaning of Life. Okay. But yeah, I don't relate to the divorce part, but I'm like, yeah, screw him, Kelly. I love it. A little righteous. I have a whole playlist called F You. Yeah. That a friend, like I, I said to all my friends, send me your songs about picking yourself back up because mm-hmm. it knocked me down. Like mm-hmm. I, we'd been together since I was 19. That's oh, when wow. I started dating him. Mm-hmm. We got married when I was 25. Yeah. And so we had been together my entire adult life. Yeah. Uh, and then it turned out that he was um, not just with me and was right. having a whole other thing happening there. 
And I like, it was as unreal to me as if you had said, Hey, by the way, did you know I can fly? And then wings sprouted out of your back. Yeah. That's about how surprised I was when everything went down. So for me, it was, it was a definite reckoning. Yeah. Um, but you know, what got me through was creativity, community, and the story I told myself, which is like, is this going to be my final chapter? Mm-hmm. Um, and strangely enough, speaking of writing, yeah. there's a point in every book that they often call it like the dark night of the soul. Okay, yeah. That's uh, it. the term. Save the, save the cat. That's the terminology he used. And I remember at one of my lowest points when I was laying in bed and I was having a good cry, I said, this is my dark night of the soul. Yeah. But there are scenes that come after. Oh, yeah. And that was what I said. I don't know what they are. I don't know what it's going to be. Yeah. But there are scenes that come after this one. So pick yourself back up. Mm-hmm. And they're always, the scenes that come after, because we're nearing the end of the movie, yeah. of the book, are always the, the comeback. Triumph. The comeback, yeah. right? So I just decided, okay, this is my dark night of the soul. That's okay, because yeah. it's not my final scene. Yeah. Just one last thing, because you brought up. Save the yeah. Cat again. Well, The Dark Night of the Soul. When you watch a show or when you read a book. <laughs> Every you, single time. Okay, so this is the regular, like the yep. ordinary oh, day. stated. There yep. it is. Yeah. Yep. Oh my God, me too. Here's the catalyst. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, so this part funny. here is called Pope in the Pool. So yeah, I 100%. I'm not yeah. the person you want to see a movie with unless you're someone who likes to do that because I'm always nudging the person and be like, oh, it's the catalyst right here. Because you see the just, dark night of the soul right you here. You just know the entire movie kind mm-hmm. of. And it's so funny. My mom loves Lifetime movies and they're uh, all already the same plot. You can always guess. Everyone <laughs> hates it because I'll be like, you know what's going to happen is this. Yeah. And then that'll be what happens. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, we're just really creative and smart. That's all. We can't help ourselves. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I could talk creativity literally okay. all day. It's our work um, and it's our passion. But I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. And to all the listeners, thank you for listening as well. Thank I you. I hope you all have great days. Take care. <laughs>